And and in the back is um, the bookshelves. And and you know what that marble is no. around here? I don't. This used to be a men's bathroom. Oh my goodness! So this is the marble that <laughs> enshrined all of the urinals. So I think it's oh quite appropriate. <laughs> That's amazing. It has some bookshelves on the urinal wall. <laughs> wow! Wow! Right, so this is like sort of a very you know kind of feminist. You're reclaiming the space. I'm reclaiming the space exactly. <laughs> uh, my gosh, that's hilarious. <laughs> Changes the, the idea of the room now. I yeah, like, yeah, because yeah, you know this this was a women's college. Right? Right, Pembroke was right. women's college, so um, I guess they let the men pee up here in those days. We had a special room. That we had a special room, <laughs> which is now my office. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm glad they got the smell out. You yeah. can't tell. Right. You can't yeah. tell at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just in terms of kind of marking our, our video here, so it's Thursday, April 19th, um, 2012, and we're at Lemonade Hall, two th room 209. Um, this is Faith Wilding's office. Wildings. Is it Wildings? Wildings, okay. yeah. Uh, Faith Welding's office at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. And would you just give us a quick, you know, sentence or two on, on why you're here at Brown? Okay. Uh, well, I just retired from a um, full-time, long-time job at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where I was chair of the performance department. And, um, and I just decided that I wanted to... Um, to, to to be in an environment where I could be associated with um, teaching and not teaching so much as, as studying, basically, because mm -hmm. I still feel I need a lot of education. Mm -hmm. Also, because I had plan, you know, I knew about Brown. I knew about the Pembroke um, Center here, which is a center for what's it called, women's teaching and learning, or something like that. You know, and. And I knew a lot of people who had been part of this, you know, where really a lot of feminist theory came out of Brown and came out of the Pembroke and, you know, a lot of people whom I've read and studied, you know, always as, as a young feminist um, artist and student and then, you know, had taught many of them too. And, and so, you know, I wanted to find a context. Um, you know, it's really hard when you're making this, this transition between being in academia and suddenly you're know, kind of cut off. Um, in terms, you know, because we have such such a problem with, you know, person with with sort of um, public intellectuals in in the U.S. You know, there's mm -hmm. like, you know, how, how are you going to find a good library? You know, how are you going to find people to talk to? You know, and I had I had decided to do this memoir or this autobiography, um, and I'd gotten a Guggenheim grant too for this project actually. So I figured I needed a context, and so. I'd been to Brown before um, my group Sabrosa performed here a couple of years ago, and I know some people here, so so here I am. That's what I'm doing, and I'm I'm attending the seminar, the Pembroke seminar, um, which is a year-long seminar, and this year it's on the subject of consent, which is a really you know kind of profound issue. So um, it's been it's been really amazing. Yeah. That's great. So it's a year-long program then. Yeah, but. Um, I've just been reaccepted for next year. So. Oh, great! So, so I'm aboard for next year. Excellent. Yeah. We can return with you back in yeah. six months. <laughs> yeah, and it's really interesting because there's a lot of um, the, you know there's this really strong feminist presence here among PhD students also, and I've been actually meeting with quite a few PhD students who are actually doing PhDs in which they're looking at feminist performance, and you know there's a very strong performance department here with Rebecca Schneider, who's also a longtime friend. So. A lot of connections, and it's really helping me. It's too. great to have a nice, supportive environment yeah. writing about your, you know. It's, it's amazing. It's hard to write about yourself sometimes, so it's nice to uh, have people that want to hear it. about it, right? <laughs> yeah. You get to float ideas. Is that a funny yeah. story? Should I include it? Exactly. That's great. <laughs> yeah, you got the idea. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, you've had a prolific career as an artist and a writer and educator, and mm -hmm. um, Sharon Sekhan, uh, who we're doing the interview for, had asked that we focus specifically on Woman House, uh -huh. um, the collaborative uh, installations. And that was mm -hmm. in the Hollywood Mansion in 1971, correct? Um, and so mm -hmm. I, I wanted to see if we could start a little broadly in terms of how you remember Los Angeles in the 1970s, just to give us some sense of mm. what was going on and what, what was kind of the, how did this, what are those yeah. impetus for this project? Well, actually, it's the 40th anniversary mm -hmm. of, of the the exhibition of Woman mm -hmm. House, which was in February 1972, mm -hmm. so um, we we started work on it in the in the fall of of um, 71. Um, and by the way, 
<laughs> this <laughs> is the first history of um, first published history of um, the the sort of the 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 fledgling feminist art uh, movement in Southern California, um, which um, which includes Women House. Um, so this was actually the first published writing almost on Women House. And it's still often referred to, so. And that was published in 76, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, um, and you can sometimes still find expensive copies on Amazon. <laughs> it's really <laughs> out of print. But, um, I mean, it was a really interesting time, full of turmoil, you know. It was um, height of bombing in Vietnam. Um, I I had been... A campus radical, part of SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, for a long time. My ex-husband and I had been, and had been very active in draft counseling. And I, and it was kind of through my my activity with um, anti-war activities at the University of Iowa, where um, which, where I got my undergraduate degree, that I had first come in contact with feminism actually, and. Um, some of the very first people who started women's the first women's studies programs were part of a sort of radical group called um, mm, mm, you mm, I've forgotten now what it's called anyway something about professors United professors of something or other <laughs> but anyway it wasn't all professors oh no it was called the New University Conference right mm -hmm. and through that. Um, I had also become interested in feminism, actually, even though I sort of, at the at the beginning, wasn't very sure of that. But um, and then I had met um, Suzanne Lacey um, in my my ex husband got a job in Fresno, California, and this was like in in seven in sixty nine, I think. And I met Suzanne Lacey there, and we immediately started a, a women's consciousness raising consciousness raising group. Although we had no idea what we were doing, really, she'd had some experience with Vista, which was sort of an inner city um, group that had been kind of organization that was dealing with sort of inner city uh, poor people, um, and she'd um, so she'd had some had begun to meet with with women and feminists through that group. Um, and I'd had my experience, and we had just decided, you know, when we we kind of met each other very early on, when when I first came to Fresno, and as a faculty wife, you know, there's nothing worse than being a faculty wife. <laughs> and, but I also simultaneously became immediately became a student because I'd only gotten my BA degree um, at the University of Iowa, and I wanted to go on. In fact, I wanted to study art because I'd gotten my bachelor's degree in comparative literature, and especially studying the work of William Blake, who okay. is, of course, a radical um, <laughs> and a feminist. Um, so um, Suzanne and I started this group. And then shortly after that, um, uh, the, the head of the art department, because I was starting to take art courses, um, the head of the art department, who, whom I knew you know, personally through, um, through sort of faculty groups, um, told me about Judy Chicago that he was bringing Judy Chicago um, to the school to because she wanted to come to Fresno to work there for a year to teach there for a year and try out some new pedagogical ideas she had about teaching women. So um, so he brought her to my house, and um, you know so I told her about what Suzanne and I had been doing. Um, and and also I had been teaching this class in the in the um, experimental university, um, which had started in Fresno. Actually, it was a really interesting thing, and I've written about this a little bit, and I'm going to write about this more. But you know, in in the late '60s and early '70s, um, but particularly in the late '60s, um, the the California State University campuses were in uproar. And and you know not just the not the, not just the state universities but also the university you know California UC system were in an uproar. Um, Reagan was was governor. Um, you know it was just you know it was during the time of of some of the most active campus demonstrations. Mm -hmm. You know sort of through across the board throughout California, and and of course you know 
my ex-husband and I Im- immediately got involved with that the minute we came to Fresno. <laughs> you know, so we were already notorious as organizers. You know, and um, so we we met the few radicals in town. You know, who are mostly from Black Studies and Chicano Studies, because you know Fresno State had a very strong. Um, Black studies and a very strong um, Chicano studies, you know, partic- particularly also involving Luis Valdez, who was a really important organizer among the farm workers, you know, because it was also the height of the farm worker strikes, if you, you know, and the boycotting of grapes and, you know, that whole the Cesar Chavez um, campaign, which, you know, since I was also draft counseling with my husband, those were most of the people who were draft counseling, were all of these young black and and Chicano students who are being basically called up, you know. And so we, we just immediately got involved with whatever that was going on in California, you know. It was, not, it was not like a nice peaceful place at that point, you know. It was really in an uproar, and the campus was in an uproar. And when, when Judy came and she was introduced to me and she told me about this, you know, let's start this this, um, I want to start a women's class. You know, and that, that was kind of the way she put it first, you know, and, and she didn't do it right away. She didn't do it in the first semester she was there. She basically did a class on, which was very interesting, which I also took, a class on sort of, um, I would call it now sort of site-specific work in the environment, you know, so all of the work was done outside because she was doing a lot of work outside um, in, she was doing a lot of works with fireworks and, you know, um, all kinds of, she's recreated them actually for this specific standard time. She rec- recreated some of those early pieces. Oh, wow. Yes, yeah, really interesting. So, um, you know, and so um, she and I, sh- she came to my house and we had a long talk and she said, you know, come on, Faye, get up. I was, I was weaving at the time, you know. And, um, and she said, get off your bench and <laughs> so, like, let's get going here. You know, so I was telling her about, you know, okay, Judy, I was born yesterday. You know, I've actually got quite a long history and, you know, in all kinds of radical organizing, you know, besides which the way I grew up in a radical pacifist commune, you know, I'm, you know, I don't know much about art except, you know, from a sort of critical and theoretical point of view, but, um, you know, I do know something about um, thinking about, you know, um, politi- politics, you know. So, um, am I getting very far afield here? No, um, no, you're fine. I'm talking about <laughs> what, what was the situation in California when I got there. Yeah. So, this was, you know, so then we started the whole Fresno program, and um, which was actually... Um, predated the CalArts one, mm-hmm. um, and about which I've also written extensively. Um, and then once we went to, Calif- to, to LA, I'm sure you're going to ask me more, more things about that, but when, you know, after we had done the, f- the, the program in Fresno, then Judy had been hired by CalArts, and, you know, and she, she'd made a deal with, a, with the head of the art school, Paul Brock, who was Miriam Shapiro's husband, um, to um, that she could bring some of her students with her. Well, we had to be admitted, you know. We had to apply to CalArts, and we had to be admitted, but um, she was going to get the, the feminist... She was going to be able to start a feminist program there and have her own students and have her own um, studio and a budget. Wow. You know? So... I know. <laughs> That's great. You need to start, you need to be the first cohort, yeah. you know, and have all these, these, these yeah, kind of to, to have this structural things in place for you. It's great. To have, you know, and it, as Mira Shore always points out, you know, it was facilitated by a man. I mean, he happened to have to be the husband of, you know, Miriam Shapiro, who had come up to Fresno and had visited our, our, the program we were doing there and, and had, you know, really connected to Judy and to all of these, you know, and she was also going to be teaching at Cal Arts on the new campus in Valencia that it had just been built up. And, um, and so it was, you know, in the, in those ways that, um, we, we got to LA, um, and I mean, for Judy, it was going back to LA because she had lived in LA and studied in LA for so many years. But, um, 
you know, and in L.A., um, I mean, yeah, it was, you know, it was the, it was the, or the beginning of the 70s, and um, CalArts was brand new. It had, it had come out of the old Chenard School, which was downtown, and, um, you know, it was, CalArts was really interesting in those early years. Um, there were a lot of husband and wife teams teaching there, which was really interesting. Um, and all of the Fluxus people were there, which was really interesting. <laughs> you know, so it was this, and, and it was a very wild and, and very um, experimental time. Lots of, you know, lots of new media things were going on. You know, the porta pack you know, video porta pack had just been kind of made, you know, viable and, and everybody was learning that and there was there was all this dance stuff going on and music, you know, new music stuff going on with Morton Subotnik, people like that. Um, it was a really interest. it had its own gamelan, you know, which is amazing. <laughs> it still has a gamelan. But, you know, it had an African drumming group. I mean, it was very, you know, all of these things that were happening in the in the in the late sixties, early seventies, with ethnic, with feminism, you know, and so we added feminism to this, you know, which was, ooh, big, and um, and you know was was something that you know through the years Cal Arts has often f forgotten and tried to bury and you know and lose, but but it's alive and well again. I'm glad to say. <laughs> So can you tell me a little bit about how the project, you know, Woman Has as a Project, came to came to be? I know you've, you've written about it, so mm -hmm. I'm just curious you know, what kind of instigated the conversation. Obviously, you were having, I'm assuming, very long conversations about um, some form of either performance or something visual to go along with mm -hmm. this, these discussions that you're having with all these mm -hmm. great scholars and with your cohort. But how did the idea of, you know, the concept of, of this particular kind of installation mm -hmm. happen? Well... <sighs> I mean, it's sort of, you know, it's become so apocryphal now <laughs> that it's, it's um, you know, my memory was that CalArts was not ready. When we moved down to CalArts, first of all, there would just been a huge earthquake. And, you know, and the, the, the Valencia campus um, had, had just been built when this earthquake happened. And all the floors... <laughs> <laughs> were like this and so they had to redo a lot of stuff so so the campus was not ready to be moved into and they had vacated the downtown campus which was, was the old Chenard school which was falling apart which however had been started by women um, which is interesting originally but you know it was definitely not a feminist education that you could get there um, so um, so all of the classes were being taught in weird places. Um, you know, nobody could be on campus um, for the first, almost the whole first quarter. Calais has a quarter system. Um, and so we had an art historian who was, so we started meeting in each other's living rooms, basically, you know, for, for a few weeks when school first started. And, and we had an art historian, Paula Harper, who was actually also connected to the program, which was, in, which was great, fantastic to have that. And, and it was Paula, I think, who said one day in one of our meetings, you know, why don't, why don't we just find a place to, um, you know, a house or something to, to work in? you know, and, 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 and examine this, all of these issues that we're talking about in, in consciousness raising. We're talking about domesticity, woman's role, woman's work, um, you know, let's model it on, you know, Virginia Woolf, a room of one's own, you know, let's make our own environment, you know, and so that's what we did. So we spent like quite a few weeks, all the students just running around everywhere in these different neighborhoods in LA looking for a place and we found this old abandoned place man it was almost kind of like a mansion in Hollywood and and we researched the deeds you know who does this belong to because it was completely deserted it was kind of broken down and we found the owner and um, Cal Arts rented it for a dollar for the year <laughs> You know, there was n no water connection, no electricity connection, no heat. 
Um, most of the windows, glass windows, had been broken. Um, so that was okay. Now what? <laughs> <laughs> so you know, the first the first four weeks, I would say, was spent actually learning um, building skills, how to glaze windows, you know, how to restoring walls, um, building walls. Um, you know, just going through the whole place and making, you know, it never did have have bathrooms that flushed or, you know, water that ran. We used a garden hose and we had to go to the, to the nearby, you know, um, um, gas station to, to pee and stuff. And, you know, and we, we looked like these wild hippies in the neighborhood, you know. <laughs> the neighbors were like calling the school all the time saying, there's all of these girls out here. <laughs> in boots <laughs> so um attacking a house right? yeah so and and we and, and what we did in terms of the content um was to was to really do concentrated consciousness raising um to think about you know we we took this tour through the house once we once we you know really were looked at all of the rooms there were three bathrooms, there were probably at least four bedrooms upstairs, big bedrooms. Um, downstairs there was a huge kind of living room, double living room, um, a laundry room, a pantry, a kitchen, a big dining room, um, a sunroom. You know, it has all of these different spaces which was really nice and had a big wild garden out behind it um, and um, so we we went through this process of um, of thinking about what we all felt like or what happened you know what happens to us as women in all of these different rooms I mean, it was interesting because, you know, most of us were very young, young students, you know. There were two grad students, myself and, and Mira Shore, but everybody else was was really young. I mean, some of them were freshmen. So there were about 20 of us all together um, who had basically would, had dedicated themselves to the feminist program for the first year. And so, so all, pretty much everything we were doing was all of our credits and credit hours were in the feminist program. Um, except for certain things that, you know, that, that undergraduate student had to take, like, I don't know, art history or something, which we also did within our program, you know. So, so that was actually really good because it was a huge amount of work, you know, just physical. We did it all in four months, you know, kind of redoing this huge house space and, and doing the whole, you know, all the installations inside. So... And learning how to do it, right? And, and learning right. how to do it, learning how to use tools and all these processes. It's having the internet to have it next to you. And <laughs> exactly. And getting all of these materials, you know, and finding materials. And, and you know, because a lot of it was actually not art materials. You know, a lot of it was... Um, was um, household materials, you know. And so thinking about, um, you know... We were only just starting to really think about the differences between high art and low art, between craft and art, you know, and you know, and how women had always been relegated to to craft. You know, anything women did was craft. You know, what men artists did was art. You know, and and also the the this hierarchy of materials. You know, I mean, besides the hierarchy of subject matter, you know, there's also the hierarchy of materials because, of course a lot of men have painted interiors of houses, you know, how many paintings do we know of, you know, nude women reclining on couches and bedrooms or, you know, or women sitting in, inside in a household or still lives or, you know, sort of interiors, right? Um, and, and most of the famous examples we know are by men, right? So it's perfectly fine if a great you know, a great painter like Cezanne or somebody like that, you know, paints his mother inside a house or, you know, paints a still life. But it's really different, you know, if a woman does it. It certainly was in those days. And also, if a woman, if a woman tries to depict um, her own reality within the house, 
which can be quite different, um, you know, in terms of experience um, and also her relationship to the rooms and to the house and to the materials in the house. And so we really also went, wanted to bring that out, you know, that, that um, thinking about the domestic and thinking about women's work and, and thinking about it um, also in, you know, in, in really, but both in very personal but also in political terms, you know, in, in terms of how, how the house can be both a trap, you know, the home can be both a trap and it, as well as a place where, of course, women have been doing the maintenance work all of this, all of these, you know, centuries. The the maintenance of actually, you know, in Mar in Marxist terms, you know, um, reproducing the the workforce basically, you know, um, making it possible for people to live and people to work and men to go out and, you know, earn the living. The women stay home and make sure that everything is actually working. So, so we 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 read a lot about that. We thought a lot about it and talked a lot about it. And then, basically, um, everybody chose a room, and and also um, certain spaces we worked on collaboratively. And um, like the dining room, for example, was kind of collaboration between about five of us and the kitchen was a collaboration between three women and um, yeah several other spaces too were were collaboratively done and then you know a lot of the spaces were also individually done by, by individual women but everything was everything was discussed you know everything was um, brought into the into discussion into the circle for discussion you know, in which we all gave feedback, and you know, I mean, that was that was one of the really exciting aspects of working on Woman House. That we all still, you know, we have reunions sometimes. A lot of us still know know each other and can get together. You know, just talking about um, how interesting and exciting it was once we really got going. You know, on doing our rooms was just to take a break and kind of like walk through the house and, you know, see what Mira was doing or what, you know, Beth was doing or what was happening in the kitchen and, you know, and then we'd have these meetings once or twice a week when everybody got together and, you know, and we all walked through the house and we, we looked at the progress that had been made and what still needed to be done and, you know, and gave feedback and, you know, gave ideas and, you know, and that was, I think, a really kind of amazing um, new way of working, you know, to a kind of beginning of real collaboration, you know, where, where the work, well, you know, I mean, the work was in this, this collaborative context, obviously, um, you know, which is, which, which already, if you're in a heavy duty art school like Cal Arts, you know, was is already sort of really going against the grain, you know, um, because there we were all being encouraged to do our own work, you know, and to, especially as graduate students, you know, you, you, know, you have to become an artist now, you know, and um, so, um, you know, it was a, it was a really different kind of pedagogy that we were trying to develop. And it brought up many really difficult issues um, for a lot of us. Um, issues of, um, well, first of all, you know, kind of the feelings and experiences that a lot of people, a lot of women had had in the house. You know, thinking a lot about our mothers, um, for example, you know, mothers and grandmothers, other women's. You know, the, sort of the whole history of being daughters and houses, um, but also thinking about um, ambition and, um, you know, and visibility and invisibility and sexuality, you know, rebellion, um, obedience, you know, all of these money. Um, <laughs> Food, all of these issues came up, you know, um, 
in these spaces. And I think that's one of the, the things that's most interesting, I think, about Woman House is the sort of, you know, very contextualized, um, the work being very contextualized, you know, and I think, I think this, this, it was very site specific, you know, and contextualized in these rooms and in this house and on this street, in this neighborhood, you know, so it was really, um, it was really radical in so many ways, you know. It was also a nightmare in many ways. <laughs> I was, uh, I was the, the TA, the teaching assistant. I was, you know, like, uh, you know, and, and Mir Miriam Shapiro and Judy Chicago were always on the road. They were giving a million lectures all over, you know, so half the time they were gone. It's and I would have the ladies. <laughs> yeah, and I would be there every fucking day, you know. It's like, all right, get going, you know. So and you in, was it like organized scheduled time that you would go to you know to go to the house and work or was it just people would drop by and work on their their part and then take off when they felt like it? Well, it was just pretty kind of... much. I mean, people did have other things they had to do. Some people had other classes. Some people had to work for a living. You know, so they had work hours. Um, but we all had, as I recall. We all definitely, you know, there were certain meeting times, mm -hmm. you know, that everybody had to be there. Um, and I was there every day. Eight o'clock in the morning, I was there, you know, and <laughs> leaving like at six at night or seven at night. Um, I was one of the few people also with a car, so I would go and pick people up and drop them off. Um, but, yeah, we, we definitely, people had to commit themselves to... Mm -hmm. It's probably something like 20, 25 hours a week at, of work at the house. Yeah, absolutely. And we had all these deadlines that we had to meet, you know, that we set up deadlines. And, you know, and then Judy and Mimi would come back from their walk, from their wanderings and, and come and you know, there'd be explosions at the house. It's like, what? You haven't finished yet? What's the matter? Look, this looks like a piece of shit. You need to do something about this. <laughs> you, know, you can't be depressed now. <laughs> so, but there'd also be great times, you know, and we'd all have lunch together and, you know, and they would praise everybody and, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, look what we did. Ah. You know, at the same time, we had, um, we had a performance group going because we did all these performances at Women House. And, and, and so we had... Oh, I'm trying to remember how often we met during the week. Then in the evening, we would we it would continue. You know, we'd be making stuff for the house, and we'd be doing performance first. I was in the performance group, um, and you know, we were we were coming up with these performances. It was not just rehearsing, or you know, but it was actually, you know, going through the process of coming up with these performances. You know, when we'd been killing ourselves all day. You know, and then in the evening to, you know, try to, you know, it was huge. It was huge um, in terms of time commitment, much more than, than I think most graduate students that I've ever supervised have spent on their work, you know. But, and also the commitment, um, I think partly because we were working collectively in that way, you couldn't just kind of wiggle out of it. You know, you you were committed to the other people too. You know, and this was, I think, p the part of the brilliance of the pedagogy. Is this like unlimited? Yeah, this, you know, it's, it's two hours, but I just want to make sure it was still oh. running. I hadn't checked it in a second. Okay. I was, <laughs> I, the sound is very important. I didn't want to lose it. So. Yeah, you know, the, I think the commitment to each other in terms of the the collective process. You know, and that and that it wasn't an individual work where. You know, we all sank and swam together, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. You know, so, okay, so this little princess over here finished her little piece. You know, it wasn't like that. It was like, um, okay, you're done. Okay, we have, you know, there's this whole thing that has to be done. You know, why don't you help those people, you know, who are painting tiny little patterns on the floor as a carpet or whatever. You know, so it was really... It, you know, you, you couldn't just, you know, say, no, I'm just doing my piece. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like that at all. You know, it was really, it was really, um, 
this this collective and you know and it was one of the most difficult parts of that because none of us had been trained to work together mm -hmm. and you know and women too you know young women it was you know we we had been trained to compete with each other you know and to um yeah so um it was you know on all levels you know kind of like boot camp <laughs> Mira show always calls it feminist boot camp <laughs> <laughs> and you know and it, but it was also hugely worth it you know it came once it opened um I don't know, so many people came through there, 10,000 people or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, we we had to, um, we did performances um, two nights a week, um, every, every Friday and Saturday we did performances, sold out performances, you know, people were hanging from the rafters, <laughs> um, and and we did tours of the house, we were open for a certain number of hours every every day. And people came from all over, you know, people brought their classes, you know, groups of children, women's groups, oh, I mean, everybody came, the media came, you know, just constantly we were, we were, you know, famous people came, Gloria Steinem came, Anais Nin came, you know, and, and all these people would visit with us there, you know, and we would have tea with them, and we would guide them through the house, and we would get tours, and so that was part of the other thing then, you know, for, we were open for a whole month, and and everybody had to take their turns to be basically the docents, you know, and tour people through, and so it was pretty huge commitment, yeah. Um, can I backtrack just a little bit? Mm -hmm. One of the questions that Sharon was really curious about was, you, you mentioned a couple times that you've had the conscious raising techniques, or that yeah. there were things that you did in the house, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I think part of it seems like it's just working together, technically living together in some ways, right, yeah. you're, if you're committing yeah. that much time. Yeah. Um, but one of the questions that she had wanted to ask was, do you see echoes of those same kind of um, conscious raising techniques, you know, alive today, and if they, if, if so, have they changed, or how have they, have they kind of evolved um, over the course of the woman house has happened to you know now as a as a feminist scholar you know, what do you, mm -hmm. you do you see the same kind of things happening I frankly not anymore mm -hmm. not not really I mean I certainly did it you know I taught for in different places for 40 years including in some pretty heavy duty art schools like Cooper Union and in Carnegie Mellon University and then the Art Institute and um, you know and there's such a there's <laughs> feminism has gone through so many ups and downs in terms of you know whether students were interested or not you know because I I taught a lot of classes in feminism feminist art feminist art making I certainly did at the Art Institute um, I taught a, class for, for, I don't know, five or six years every year called um, Next Feminisms, in which, you know, in which I tried out, a lot of which was performative. I mean, we're doing a lot of reading, but we're also doing a lot of kind of performance and work about, you know, and I mean, by that time, because I started there in 2002, by that time, feminism and fem feminist art had become so... Um, institutionalized in certain ways, you know, or at least people knew about it. At least people could, although I still constantly, when I'm speaking at places like I did at, at you know, UMass of Boston the other day, it's like, okay, so I saw Lynn Hirschman's film. That was the first time I'd ever really seen anything about the feminist art movement. I'm going like, why? There's all of these books and I started listing them, you know. It, it, yeah, and it's really, it just boggles the mind to me how, you know, it keeps being rediscovered, sort of, you know. Oh, you know, and um, I mean, until very recently, actually, you couldn't find any images of Woman House online till, till, till a few years ago when this group of young women artists um, in Brooklyn did a show at Momenta Gallery. Um, in which they kind of did redid 
sort of this idea of woman house, um, although in very contemporary terms. And then they invited myself and Mira Shore to, to give a talk there and to show one of the woman house movies. And the place was packed, packed to the gills so that I couldn't even be in the room because I'm a claustrophobic. And, um, you know, and there was such huge interest. And, and it was after that we actually put some women has stuff on on Sabrosa's website because there wasn't anything. Mm -hmm. You know, people kept writing to me saying, like, can't find anything except, you know, your book, and I can't even find a copy of your book. And I kept saying, here, here is stuff about Woman House, you know, the power of feminist art. Come on, how long has that book been out? Since the early 90s, you know? It's like they're hearing it for the first time. You know, it's this really interesting thing. But, but I, I think this probably doesn't just happen to feminism. Um, you know, it's this thing about history, especially in America, I think. You know, it's like the, the sense of what history is and, you know, and, and the importance of it. You probably encounter this mm -hmm. all the time in York. You know, and the importance of history, how, you know, if we don't know our history, we're just lost. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just lost. My students do it. I was explaining my project to them, and I'm looking at um, particular conversations around uh, Chinese uh prostitutes in, in the vice industry yeah and the same and you can literally take pieces of the text and yeah. just change Chinese to Mexican and you yeah. have the exact same conversations about yeah. you know closing off borders who gets to mm -hmm. come in and who doesn't mm -hmm. who counts mm -hmm. as citizen and why yeah and particularly on issues of, of Chinese women being very particular yeah. problems that yeah. you know if you bring the woman here then you're gonna stay yeah. you know you're not gonna marry a white woman yeah that's a whole separate issue yeah right but if you bring Chinese women here that's mm -hmm. when they're gonna stay and we're gonna have this you know the yeah. quote unquote rat population taking over the west coast and slowly like an infestation yeah. moving yeah. east and that's you know the students were like people talked about the Chinese like that and I can see Mexicans but like the Chinese really I'm like you, are you this, kidding? This, there's a legacy of this these are not new they things don't know we're anything about <laughs> all the Chinese railroad workers who are brought here and stuff like that not, I mean where do they think Chinatowns came from in it's San Francisco it's where restaurants are for I mean that's it's restaurants and you can buy um, cheap stuff you know and there's just and it's, you know, brown, yeah. and that's the thing that really is surprising to me. Boggles is, the mind. If this is what, you know, the top I elite know. students are thinking. I know. What's out there is terrifying. I know, <laughs> it really it's is. terrifying. We have these conversations with the TAs yeah. all the time. We're just mm -hmm. like, how do they, you know, they're starting from a basic premise. You know, mm -hmm. we need Jacob Reese, um, the, the class I'm yeah. TAing right now. We started Jacob Reese, yeah. and they're like, what's a tenement? You know, you're like, <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's like a housing project. You're mm -hmm. like, oh, there's like the same thing. Like, no, it's, it's no, very it's different. Really, <laughs> go tour the Tenement Museum right. in New York. <laughs> but there's definitely a sense of, oh, that happened in the past. It's it's something that particular yeah. kinds of people are interested in. But it does mm -hmm. no resonance for me because I'm an econ student or yeah. I'm a med student. I don't care. Like, there's yeah. just this sense of words don't matter, ideas yeah. don't matter. That's what other people study, but it's not my thing. Yeah. And they really don't understand how it's part of their everyday life and their understandings of race yeah. and gender and sexuality. Yeah. that they're all tied uh, based on all of those histories too right. yeah so I definitely agree it's just one of those yeah. it's kind of it's very sad um, in the classroom and it's you it's hard not to get demoralized after you have class after class after class where you're like I'm really the first time you've heard this <laughs> <I'm> really <laughs> me <laughs> you know I, I figure you know you're 22 you don't know what I'm talking about that's that's scary yeah. internment camps is one a lot of the students when you're talking about internment camps they're like what was that I'm like yeah. you know all about internment camps yeah. they're like no, no. They're like you didn't hear about it in high school or grade school. Like it just didn't, it just isn't taught. So it's, it is, it's very surprising. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's difficult, but I, I forget the question that you asked me, but. Oh, um, the echoes of the techniques, if, if that kind of conscious. Oh raising, yeah. The right? consciousness raising. I mean, I talk, you know, it's, it's interesting because no, no, I, I've never really done quote-unquote classic consciousness raising in a class, but I've, I've adapted versions of that, you know, where people have to talk about their own experience. Mm -hmm. You know, in the next feminisms class, for example, I, I often, it was often filled with, it was like the United Nations, I always say, <laughs> so like all these different foreign students. Mm -hmm. They were interested in feminism because it wasn't taught in any of their un universities that they came from. You know, and often they were very, very hostile to it 
but they were kind of fascinated, you know, and they liked me, so, <laughs> you know, I was like, the lure, you know, and then they'd become rabid feminists, most of them, you know, which was so great, and and so we talked a lot about personal experience, you know, the, 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 the very different kinds of personal experience around the same topics, you know, when everybody started talking about their mother in a group like that, you know, or everybody started talking about, um, what were the attitudes towards um, education of women, you know, things like that. Um, and it, which was always, you know, and then people just started telling their stories, you know, and then often they started making work about their stories, you know, which is which is really the way we were trying to use consciousness raising. And Judy Shakara certainly is always insisting on this, you know, that the consciousness raising is not so much for wallowing in your own you know, grief, but to really think through the issues, you know, to, to come up with, you know, think, how, how are you thinking about your stories, how are you thinking about this content, you know, what's, what's important in the content to, to bring into the work, you know, and how do you move from actually becoming aware of histories and becoming, you know, awake to, um, to conditions and experiences um, so that you can use them in your work basically, you know, mm -hmm. so that they can inform you. Um, and, and, and that's ex essentially what we were doing in the feminist program, you know, was to, was to try to figure out how one can make work about the subject matter that is feminist, that has, that has, that's really thinking about gendered experience, you know, and, and finds ways um, both 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 materials and contexts and forms which can get at that experience and the difference of that experience you know from regular art school you know oil painting and drawing from the nude and whatever it is you know just like we need new forms we need new new contexts we need new ways of you know so so it was very experimental in that way too, you know, it's like combining art and craft and the high art and the low art and, you know, materials and, um, you know, I mean, I crocheted a room basically, you know, which was, uh, which was kind of a very new way to use crochet, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, some fiber artists were doing things like that, although not in the same, not in this kind of contextual way, um, but, um, you know, it was a very, it was using a, you know, a craft material um, and process, you know, to to make a sculpture, basically, you know. So, and there was a lot of that going on in Woman House. Mm -hmm. you know. So using using traditional materials in a different way, within the, and maybe yeah. obviously within the context. Yeah. That, yeah. That you took it up another notch. Yeah. That's which right. which now of course is all the rage again right. in craftivism, you know, mm -hmm. all this craft stuff quote-unquote craftivism and craft stuff that's going on, you know, that all, all the students, I mean, you know, at the Art Institute, it was like, oh, my God, you know, people were just like, <laughs> you know, fiber and material studies was like the hottest program there, uh -huh. you know, and I, I worked with a lot of students from that program who were just, you know, bursting out all over in, <laughs> in these projects, you know, that wouldn't have dreamed of doing in an art school, you know, 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was really... And, and, you know, I attribute that old feminism. Right. <laughs> from the start. <laughs> All has a root. To kind of bring it back to, to women as because, you know, which is actually really true, you know, there was a really important show at the Bronx Museum that Lydia Yi um, curated in um, 95, I think it was, um, called Women's Work in Contemporary Art. Mm -hmm. And it started with, well, it started with the Yayoi Kusama. Are you familiar with mm -hmm. Yayoi Kusama? Very, very interesting She's Korean, yeah. Would that be Korean? It or would that be Japanese? Japanese. Yeah, Japanese. It Japanese. She's Japanese, yeah. So I saw myself a <laughs> um, Who, a wild, wild artist who actually lives in, in an institution. She's uh, been, inst but, she, but she was also doing a lot of performance. Uh, and then, and then they had, she, Lydia had us recreate several rooms from Women House in that show in the Bronx Museum. Um, including the crocheted piece, I redid it there. And um, it was, um, 
I'm trying to figure out why I'm saying why I'm telling this story. Oh, it just showed this 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 trajectory, this this history of how um, you know how quote unquote women's work, both in terms of the household materials and the subject matter, and you know that stuff that's been called women's work craft has completely flowed into the mainstream. You know, and men are using it now. You know, anybody can use that material now, you know, and and that subject matter. You know, it's been completely absorbed by the mainstream of art. And um, it is, it's often not acknowledged, though, that it's really came from this early experimentation in feminist art. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not saying that for the record. <laughs> <laughs> we started it. It came from a point. Mm -hmm. and there's a point of origin. Um, one of the I, it was interesting that you said that the international students were in a lot of your classes, and mm -hmm. um, one of the you know traditional critiques of the women's movement is that people of color, you know, particularly yeah. women of color, weren't yeah. necessarily included. When mm -hmm. you did the you know the installation, did you was there an audience um, of people of color coming to see the the show, and was there a feeling of um, mm -hmm. Was there a different kind of response, do you think, from those different audiences? That's a really interesting question because, of course, L.A. has a huge, you know, huge um, community of, of Chicanos and Chinese and Japanese and Koreans. And, I mean, and now, of course, it's expanded like crazy, but even at that time. And, yeah, a lot of, a lot of you know, I, my favorite visitors were always the school kids. You know, and, and school kids came from all over L.A. You know, I remember whole classes full of black school kids, teenagers. Oh, my God, the teenagers. Like, I remember these young black teenagers just running all over the house and then finding Judy Chicago's menstruation bathroom and going like, Ah, girl, can you see that? It's like, ah! <laughs> He's got Kotex there! It's all bloody! <laughs> And they were, they were just amazed. They were hilarious. Kids loved Women House. They would just like, you know, of all ages, they loved it. They would, you know, they they got it. Mm -hmm. You know, for them it was like, you know, they they just totally to them it was, you know, they understood it, you know. They, they just could really relate to it. And, um, yeah, there were a lot of people from... From all different kinds of ethnic backgrounds mm -hmm. and, and racial backgrounds, but you know, in a Cal Arts itself, of course, is like most art schools that I've been in, very white. Still is mm -hmm. actually very white. They still have so many problems, um, as does the Art Institute in Chicago. You know, Chicago is a huge black community, right? And we're always sitting there in the diversity meetings going like, why aren't there more black students here? And I'm like, yeah, do you know how much it costs? Mm -hmm. You know? And do you know how like black parents aren't going to send their kids to an art school? That costs fifty thousand dollars a year. Are you crazy? Right. You know, even if they could afford it, they wouldn't do it. Most black parents wouldn't do that. Because they know there's no future in it, you know, for one thing. You know, <laughs> with a lottery more, to become a, you know, a famous yeah. artist, right? <laughs> much more <laughs> pragmatic than that. Bella Hooks always used to say that. But, you know, I think that's not really the reason, um, you know, that, that the art schools are not more integrated. I think, it's, I think it's just, you know, just still this really long-standing kind of Understanding that, you know, just, just like women didn't used to be welcome, you know. Mm -hmm. um, now it's it's still, I think, you know, racial and ethnic discrimination. But particularly also because of the associate, I think anyway, because of the association of, um, say, black and Chicanas with not having the economic means or not having, not having been brought up to think that they can that they can succeed culturally mm -hmm. you know or intellectually I don't know if that makes any sense to you you know because you know like black kids have been told okay you're good at athletics right. you know that's what you should be doing um, there's those niche things that they're allowed to be good at yeah and, then that's what's yeah, and you know I mean in at the art institute we have tons of Korean students undergraduates mostly 
that's the biggest ethnicity there, hmm. or whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 I can't say race. Korean yeah, is not a race. Yeah. It's an ethnicity. ethnicity. Yeah, no. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Anyway, <laughs> it, 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 yeah, it's really interesting because, um, you know, there's this, this desire by well-to-do Korean parents to have their kids go to hotshot art schools. I really? bet they have a bunch of them at RISD, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to achieve there. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm Korean by um, ethnicity, but I'm yeah. adopted, so my parents are both Caucasians, you know, and uh -huh. I was raised in the middle of Illinois. Yeah. But I, even, you know, all the, uh -huh. the stories that I hear from Asian yeah. students mm -hmm. here, um, mm -hmm. particularly Korean, and Korean students seem to notice I'm Korean and, you know, I talk about yeah. something. And, uh, based on that and you know, I don't have the same experience so I, I can't mm -hmm. talk about my you know my Korean mom or my Korean dad and mm -hmm. what was it like when you told them you wanted to be a humanities student you know like yeah. my parents you know have been very supportive but mm -hmm. they're also white you know yeah. and so I yeah. you know I was raised in the middle of little mm -hmm. literally middle of the Midwest yeah um, with mostly white students and yeah. mostly white private schools so uh -huh. we don't have the same experience yeah. I can't tell mm -hmm. you that mm -hmm. but it's definitely something that I, that's very surprising to me yeah from hearing especially from the students here mm -hmm that do feel challenged, you know, if they decide yeah. they don't want to go to med school, or don't want to go to law school, it's like, yeah. well, there's nothing else. That's, that, yeah. Those are your two options. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, easily my most two most brilliant grad students that I ever had at the Art Institute um, were Korean women, you know, and, and I'm in close touch with mm -hmm. both of them. And they're back in Korea, and they're showing like crazy, and they're showing the most unbelievable work Oh, that you could, could like you're allowed to show that in Korea. I don't think you'd be allowed to show that in America. But <laughs> you know, they keep telling me Korea is so. You know, they forbid you to do this and to do that. And, and I was like, you know, <laughs> you, you probably couldn't show this in most places in America. But um, it's 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 really interesting how um, this kind of rebellion is. You know, they allow themselves a, this rebellion in America that they would not be allowed to show in Korea, but once they've gotten the sort of the okay from the hotshot art school, you know, then they're sort of special in Korea, hmm. you know. Oh yeah, my kid's been to the, you know, Chicago art school, you know, right. so, so there's you know. A, there's a stamp of yeah. approval that so, their work is then validated. That's, that's so they, they taught them how to do that stuff. <laughs> 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 it's real. No, it's really fascinating. But yeah, we did have a lot of. Um, we didn't have. I'm just trying to think. The group that we had, at women's building. I don't think there was a. You know, anybody really. Eth you know, from any different race or ethnicity in that particular group, except if you count Jews. We had some Jewish people, but a lot of the, the students were from very um, very low income backgrounds mm -hmm. um, and you know who had very working class parents and and um, you know came from poverty um, so you know I think that that makes a difference too you know to especially when you're dealing with this kind of subject matter of women's work and the labor, you know, domestic labor and so on, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, so those kind of differences made made a real difference. Um, but yeah, it's, um, you know, I mean, it's interesting and in just recently being back in LA at some conferences um, about the histories of all those times, kind of thinking back to them and and meeting the few women of color, um, more, I mean, I think there, there were more um, people, more, I knew more women who were Korean than, than I knew black women, and, and I knew some Chicano women, um, and also Chicano male artists um, in L.A., um, but um, but more the, there's a very there was a very strong Korean um, artist community there, mm -hmm. and and some of them found their way to the woman's building, for example, and to women's space, and you know and there were but there were always a few sort of token black artists like Betty Sarr and her daughters, and 
and a couple of other people who were very involved. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, it's I mean, I think the demographic has changed tremendously now. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but I, I still think probably the smallest number of you know of students of color um, are black. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, I, I've heard that from my friends who currently teach at CalArts. Yeah. I think you see more of them at Otis, for example, which okay. is cheaper and which is more. Or maybe they're maybe they're trying harder to recruit them. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not sure. No. Yeah, we had quite a few black students at, at Cooper Union, and mm -hmm. why? Because Cooper Union is free, basically, and they had this very very active um, Saturday program. They called it. And they 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 got all the the best kids um, from all of the high schools, inner city high schools, all the high schools around New York and did this really intensive Saturday program with them for a year and then they could apply, you know, to become students at Cooper mm -hmm. Union and many of them made it. And that's how that's how Cooper Union really developed, you know, a, a much more integrated mm -hmm. class. So building with the more diverse cohorts by kind of getting them early and then yeah. admitting yeah. them later. Okay. Yeah. And uh -huh. really, really putting a lot of energy into finding them, you know, and then also because the school didn't charge tuition, mm -hmm. you know. So, it makes, yeah, so all they that, had to do the is get there on the bus or on the subway, you know. Show up and we'll teach you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's hard enough getting my students to show up so I can teach them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the, yeah, they don't have the same but kind of boundaries But all those things make way. a huge difference, yeah, definitely. right? You know, if you don't have a car, mm -hmm. you know, and you live in the valley in L.A., you know, it's really hard to get... I was only traveling from Sierra Madre to the Huntington, and yeah. you know, it was an hour and 15 minutes on the bus oh, yeah. both ways, and a yeah. mile walk between the two spots. Yeah. And Plus, you know. you're traversing all these neighborhoods. Yeah, you, know, you go somebody, on forever. <laughs> yeah, and suddenly you're like in somebody's gang territory, yeah. you know. Yeah, I had no idea where I was going. I had my iPhone out and was just yeah. walking the map. I'm like, well, it looks like this is where the bus stop is. Yeah. You know, and I walked, I think mm -hmm. I walked a good mile and a half, two miles the first yeah. day on the phone with my mm -hmm. dad. He's like, where are you yeah, in LA? Like, yeah. you know, he, his daughter's wandering around LA by herself yeah. with her phone out, and mm -hmm. he's like, "Are you okay? Like, I'm in a really residential space right now. Yeah. I feel okay. There's yeah. a lot of cars. Like, I feel okay. It's yeah. you know, only four o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> if I don't find the bus by the time it gets dark, then I will find a cab. Mm -hmm. But like right now, mm -hmm. I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, but it's definitely, and I hadn't, I never been in that position, and I'd never yeah. been without a car. I don't have one here in Providence, but I, you know, live a couple blocks away. You know, it's not the same deal, but yeah, you know, seven miles seems so quick and so easy. It's ten minutes, you know, to get to two places, but yeah, you know, it's a two-hour commute both ways no, to, to do research, and it was rough. <laughs> yeah, LA is terrible that way. Yeah, yeah. you'll find a lot more kids of color um, in the state universities. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's where, and especially also Chicanos. You know, because Mexicans have, like more than 50% of the population now in, in the L.A. area, you mm -hmm. know, and they're very proactive in, you know, entering the schools and getting educations and, you know, very... So they're, they're now really, you mm -hmm. know, half the, half the student body. Also in, in the universities, um, the, the UC system, you know, mm -hmm. it's huge. Even, even though they've raised the tuition, you know, it's still like... So much cheaper right. than practically any other colleges, mm -hmm. you know, and they're fantastic. Mm -hmm. They're really good colleges. Yeah, the tuition is always a you know the big question. We were just looking I'm in a university administration course right now, and mm -hmm. we we're looking at um, the buzzwords that people search on the Brown search engine and the gigantic you know the word map. Financial aid is the biggest one next yeah. to tuition. You know, yeah. everything else yeah. kind of falls away. Yeah. But those are the two yeah. big things people want to know about. Yeah, to go in order to go to school. Yeah, it's definitely an issue. And, you know, it doesn't change when you're a graduate student. You know? Yeah, um, you know, plus they reckon on the parents. You mm -hmm. know, supporting the students. Partially, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Some parents just can't do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they definitely want, you know, you have to go to college. It just seems like the next step. But if you can't yeah. afford it, it's in, yeah. and you're saddled with debt mm -hmm. for the next yeah. 10 years, 20 years, you know, what are you going to do? Especially if you want to go to, um, you know, do a humanities program or go or to art, art school. school. And, you know, the return yeah. isn't there. You can't say, well, I'm going to make that yeah. back. <laughs> Good you know? luck with that. Yeah, right? it's like, it'll yeah. work out. It'll be okay. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. But it is hard. I, I had a student mm-hmm. the other day. I told them, you know, you should you should think about American studies instead of poli sci. Like, I think yeah. you'd be a really good American studies student. Yeah. And he's like, well, what am I supposed to do with that? I'm like, well, you can do the same thing you would do with a poli sci degree. And he's like, no one knows what American studies means. If I apply to law school, they're going to want poli sci, not American studies. And it is. They're very, you know, students are very tied to the job market right now. Yeah. And finding what will sell when, yeah. when they get out, and yeah. you can't blame them for that. Yeah, but it does limit the kind of you know access that you have to, yeah. to show them that our stuff matters too, and you yeah. should you should be interested in it just because you're a person, not because yeah. you have to make money yeah. or you know be successful off of it. I know it's so sad. I never thought about job things when I went to school. I just didn't, just wasn't on my radar. It comes and goes. I think it, yeah. you know we we have these. I got panic three moments, job but... offers in full for full time teaching jobs. Mm-hmm. The minute I left Cal Arts, I didn't take any of them. <laughs> so it was like, you know, so I wanted to stay in LA, and none of them were in LA. Mm-hmm. You know, and I mean, you know, that would be suicide nowadays right, if right. you even got three offers. You can go teaching. wherever they offer you. <laughs> Exactly. That's what, what I tell all my in? students. It's like, you know, if you really want to succeed in academia, you have to start somewhere, and yep. you have to be willing to go anywhere. And because you almost, could, and teach almost anything, be, right? Yeah, You're taking teach all the survey anything. courses, and yeah. you know, you yeah. get to build your own syllabi once you, you know, yeah. become an established scholar. But grad school is not a guarantee that you get to do that. No. Even coming from you know an Ivy League university, there's still that. Oh yeah, I've been talking to the PhD yeah. students here in the seminar. I'm giving out all kinds of advice because. <laughs> <laughs> How did, how did you get this great job that you had? Well, <laughs> yeah, it's really times that so harsh right now. So, were there other questions? Oh, sure. Um, uh, I was one of the kind of key things that I know that we're the Sharon was interested in is how your contemporary work um, might have some refrains from Woman House. I mean, or is it something that kind of was a it, it happened and obviously it still um, influences the way that you you think about things and you've been talking about it mm-hmm. um, in the context of kind of the last forty years of your your work experience. Yeah. But I'm 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 curious if there's anything particular that you kind of have tied over or has carried over um, between those two your current projects and that project. Well, you know I think all of the work that I've ever done. You know, whether it's collectives, and I've worked with several collectives, and now, you know, for the last 12 years with Sub Rosa, um, has been based on feminist issues, mm-hmm. you know, and, and a lot of the same issues of the body, of reproduction, of sexuality, of, of you know, women's work, labor. Um, you know, we've done quite a lot of work in Sub Rosa about, about biotechnology and assisted reproductive technologies and a lot of those issues about about um, you know maternity and the kind of and fertility you know all of those issues which I think they're all you know very sort of classic feminist issues you know and in very different you know and we've 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 worked in Spain and we've worked in Eastern Europe like Croatia and Slovenia and Serbia and you know looked at at a lot of the ways in which um, um, women's health and and fertility are treated there and how there's all of this fertility tourism and kind of really looking at um, also doing a lot of work about um, feminism in those countries um, because you know a lot of those countries are just kind of beginning to wake up to to not not the Soviet style feminism that they that was forced on them, you know, which they all hated and resented, because it basically meant that they had to work twice as hard as men because they had to do all the women's work and all, all the men's work too. But um, but more these issues of you know of um, of consciousness and of and of um, self empowerment and of Thinking about, um, you know, having a life of your own, you know, and of, of being able to, um, you know, being able to pursue, you know, to really think about what you actually want to do, you know, rather than sort of state mandated, um, you know. You're just going to be treated 
exactly like everybody else, you mm-hmm. know. I mean, there's there's really interesting issues there about, you know, what kinds of power women actually do have in in a lot of those Eastern European countries. It's really interesting because, you know, on the one hand, yeah, they were allowed to go to, to school and they were expected to, you know, to, to, to have careers and so on, but... But they were still treated in this incredibly sexist way most of the time, mm-hmm. you know, in in the universities and um, you know, and and just you know the status of women in terms of you know being known in the arts and stuff like that was was really low. Um, we found in most of the countries, although you know, maternity benefits were much better than America. <laughs> you know, I mean that there's there's all of these very interesting differences. You know, with that. Um, so, what am I talking about? I've lost my thread. Oh, you're talking about your contemporary work. In, uh, oh yeah. yeah. So, um, so I mean, and that's really think and thinking about cyber feminism. You know, so so f- basically feminism on the net, on the web, um, and thinking about, you know, women and technologies and, you know, the huge, the huge conversation there still is about that, you know, mm-hmm. the whole, the whole issues of, of, you know, women networking, you know, and, and what does it mean to have feminism on the net when, you know, What's mostly on the net is pornography, good old style pornography, you know, but but also issues about identity, um, you know, which which the these virtual technologies have brought up in terms of you know you can be anybody you want to be on the net. No, you can't actually. Um, you know, it's like you're still you've still got this body, you mm-hmm. know, and just just looking at all of the different ways in which in which feminism and gender you know, has has changed, but also has in so many ways stayed the same. I mean, it just seems so inconceivable in a way, you know, that all these issues of women's, you know, contraception and fertility mm-hmm. and stuff, it's like, you know, Ro, Ro versus Wade never happened. Or it's mm-hmm. like we never had, you know, do we have to go through it all over again? You know, I'm getting giant mailings every day now from every feminist group in the country, you know. Send us money, they're attacking birth control. You know, it's like, Arr. <laughs> you know, We've already it's, done that fight. <laughs> yeah, but it's right. just like, you know, Starting when over. is it ever going to end? You know, so, mm-hmm. so yeah, I'm still there. <laughs> you know, in so many ways, thinking about, um, you know, all of these issues now, too, internationally, globally, you know, the, because there's so many parts of the world in which feminism is really coming to its, into its own in this huge way, but in different, you know, in, in, in different, it expresses itself in different ways. We can't, we don't want it to be and can't expect it to be in the Western ways, you know, and, and I, I th- that's such an interesting conversation to me, you know, my best friend is, is Russian, you know, and she grew up under communism, and, you know, and she's a very brilliant young woman, and she's, you know, she's, um, she's now teaching women's studies in this country, mm-hmm. and, you know, so we have real, and I've been in Russia with her too, and, you know, we have really amazing conversations, um, and, you know, and there's this, this really important, she's about 30 years younger than I am, so there's a really important intergenerational kind of conversation going on too. Um, very, 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 very fruitful conversation. And, and that's something that I'm also really interested in, although I hate this word intergenerational, um, but I also hate the waves, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, not Virginia Woolf's The Waves, which I love, but um, <laughs> these waves of feminism, because it gives a false sense, I think, of, um, you know, that first there was this kind of feminism, then there was this kind of feminism. It's just not the way it works. It's just not the way it works, you know. And, I mean, some of the most radical feminist demands are still the ones that early s- suffragists made. Mm-hmm. They wanted to destroy the state, the family, and the institution of the church, you know. Okay. How are we doing on that? You know? <laughs> That's what I always say. How are we doing on that? Not a lot of progress. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so yeah, and, and I've also done a lot of personal work that 
is very much about um, myself growing up in a, and this is what I'm writing my memoir about too, um, in a in a very puritanical um, religious commune in South America where I was born. And so, um, you know, where I sort of mm, grew up and, you know, which gave me all these other ideas about what women were supposed to be <laughs> mm -hmm. and do, which I, you know, which I overturned in my own life. But that's been partly my struggle too, is to, um, is to, um, create my own um, set of ethics in my own, you know, idea of, you know, of what I want in my life and, you know, what I want to do and what I can do and what kind of a voice do I have. Um, you know, I've always had to work against all of the things I was brought up to do or not to do. Um, you know, and it's not, it's not, I don't think it's productive to just always be, be against something, you know, mm -hmm. you have to be for something too, so mm -hmm. that's been a really, um, you know, and, and for me, it's really, feminism is what, you know, helped me mm -hmm. the most and inspired me the most and, you know, which, which has become, you know, which has become, you know, so intertwined with my life's work. So it's also very personal for me. Mm -hmm. It's very political, but it's also very personal. Do you think, um, an installation like Woman House, or even the performance Weeding that you did mm -hmm. at Woman House, do you think those have would have the same resonance if they were? You talked about the the artist who had recreated in some sense, you know, mm -hmm. a kind of what Woman House was about. But do you think it would have the performance of the installation have the same resonance with an audience today, or was it a of a particular kind of moment? Well. Just personally, I know that the waiting piece still makes people cry, mm -hmm. and I get I get one or two emails or letters every week still saying I just discovered the piece or I just read it somewhere you know because it's been reprinted several times and you know and people find it uh, and it's on the web of course it's on my website um, and people are still it's it's like one of these iconic pieces mm -hmm. you know and I've actually redone it I did redid it for the big um, whack show which was this big show and which started in LA in 2007 whack art and the feminist revolution which was a huge international show of feminist sort of the you know feminist work from from the 70s to the to the 90s or something um, and um, I, I I completely redid that piece um, to to sort of um, show where I am now with all of these things, but it's it doesn't have it hasn't had anything like the resonance that the waiting piece still has. I still get all the time from young women. This is what shocks me the most from young women. Oh, I totally relate to that piece. Oh, yeah, that's about my life. It's like really, that's really sad. <laughs> You know, and then the crocheted piece has been like a favorite with everybody. I thought that piece, that piece was made site specific in the Bronx. I had to remake it in the Bronx Museum because it was actually stolen from Women House. Oh yeah. really? Yeah, and um, yeah, I mean, amazingly, even though it was nailed to the floor and the walls, it was stolen. It was gone. Um, oh my the, Yeah, so I had to redo it for for Lydia Yee's show. She asked me to redo it, so I did redid it in the Bronx Museum and. That piece has traveled. It was in the Wax Show, so it was in four different venues. It's been shown in LA four times since then. It's it's just been in a show at the ICA in Boston called Dance Draw, which is also opening at the Tang Museum in July. And I've finally given that piece to the ICA because I don't want to deal with it anymore. This is like get it out of my sight. You know, people just love that work. You know, and it's just become one of this iconic pieces and and everybody's it's been reproduced zillions of times in different books to illustrate I don't know everything from therapy to I don't know interior architecture to you know it's really it's this really interesting thing about you know I always tell my students now you know beware of the work you make as a student because it may never go away <laughs> it'll follow you for the rest of your life it'll follow you for the rest of your life carry it around yeah which is 
you know, it's just one of those things. And, um, you know, and I've done so much work since then, you know, and it's been, but it's been much, much harder for me to, to be, to get that work out in the world, um, you know, and, and when people see it, um, they go like, whoa, that's just really different than your waiting piece and your crochet piece. Like, yeah, uh huh, you know, I mean, that's, as an artist, you have to evolve, you know? I mean, I, I can't stay in the same place. I'm not in the same place, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, but it's, it's still, to me, really a puzzle um, about how to, you know, how one brings all these things together. I think that's one of the reasons that I wanted to do this autobiography, is partly just for my own sake, is to try to understand what is a life's work, you know, because one goes through all these different stages in life. You know, I'm now almost 70, and, you know, I started that work for the feminist people. I, I was kind of a late bloomer because of, you know, the way I grew up and having to do a few years of high school when I came to America, which was horrible. Um, and um, so I, I was, I think I was 28 when I was in the, in the feminist, um, you know, workshops, doing the, doing Women House. So, you know, it's been a long, I've had a long career. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm still working so much, too, now. So, you know, I've done so many different things. And that's, of course, another thing, you know, if you're not consistent, if you don't, you know, if you do all of these different things, that's harder, too, to, you know, make into sort of get people's minds around it, you know. Mm -hmm. People get so stuck on certain things so that you then get known for something, you know, they're, oh yeah, you know, people say to me, I love your work, and I go like, which work are you talking about, <laughs> you know, because it's, I mean, it's fine if they like waiting or if they like the crocheted environment, you know, those are actually good pieces, um, and they came at a very important moment, you know, um, but um, they both came from Woman House, mm -hmm. but um, you know, but I've done. You I think, done. I think yeah. I've done important work since then. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm, and I'm, of course, you know, people ask me to come speak all the time, and you know, and and I have shown a lot of my work, and you know, and I have written a lot about from the start and all kinds of things, and I've been published a lot, and you know, so I'm not complaining. I'm just saying it's, it's really, um, it's really. You know, what I'm interested in now in is is just kind of trying to see this trajectory, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's very hard to write about. I'm finding myself very, you know, tr you know, trying to remember these, you know, how this, how this trajectory works. You know, because I think, you know, finally um, that I have to, that I'm also responsible to writing my own history. Mm -hmm. You know, because, well, this is what Virginia Woolf tells us to do in the end of A Room of One's Own. She's, she says, you know, that we must write our own histories because nobody else will mm -hmm. write them for us. And if we don't write them, they will just be forgotten. You know, because she talks all the time in A Room of One's Own. She keeps saying, like, what were women doing all of those years when Shakespeare was writing his plays and when Keats was writing his odes and when, you know, Shelley and when, you know, men were making empires. What were the women doing? We never hear about them. <laughs> they were at home raising kids, you know, right. making life possible for everybody, you know. But they weren't writing their own histories. I'd give anything for the woman that loves one particular woman that I'm looking at in my project and I just keep hoping that I'm gonna find some random, you know, she wrote a two page letter, there's a journal somewhere, you know, it's that yeah. it's that golden yeah. piece of evidence yeah. that, you know, you just cross your fingers and keep hoping that yeah. it's out there somewhere. Yeah. Because yeah. it didn't, there is no there's yeah. no little writing, you know, yeah. it's about women but not by yeah. them. And if and it's interesting because Wolf was so interested in letters, you know, and she said that that's women's literature mm -hmm. is their letters, you know, or their household accounts, 
you know, she I don't know if you've read A Room of One's Own, but it's very interesting because she talks about how she went to the British Museum to start trying to track down women. Okay, where am I going to find them? What the hell were they doing? You know, and she finds some household accounts from some lady living in the country, in a big country house, and, you know, and so she... So she spent this much on candles, and she spent this much, you know, for the household. This is the only trace of this woman. Mm -hmm. You know, or she wrote maybe three poems. Why did she write these poems? What was the rest of her life like? You know, I mean, it's so... And that's what really interests me, too, is, you know, this kind of texture of everyday life, which is, which is basically one of the things that we were thinking about a lot too in feminist art is like, you know, which has become of course now completely fashionable, right? Everybody talks about everyday life, you know, and this is how do we, you know, how do we make art about everyday life? You know, how do you make art about time passing? You know, which is, of course, again, going back to my favorite author, Virginia Woolf, you may have noticed by now. <laughs> <laughs> I know all the work by art, um, which is one of the things she was doing. You know, what is the texture of everyday life? And, you know, how do we, because that's all we have, basically, mm -hmm. right? And how do we come to consciousness, you know, and to, um, I mean, so what is it all about? You know, what is it for? And, you know, and so she, those are her sub. That's her subject. Mm -hmm. You know, many people find it very off-putting and very self-absorbed. But um, I disagree with them. So it's you know, it's like um, I I'm still doing that. You know, I'm still trying to sort of really figure out how to um, how to talk about that in the many different ways in which I act in the world. You know, which is teaching and lecturing and writing and making visual work and performing. And, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's it's not a tidy package. It seems like the perfect place to end. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like you you know you wrapped up kind of your motivation and how you see the yeah. world. Just, it seems like you can't get any better than that to end it. <laughs> okay. Well, do you think I covered? Yes, I mean we covered we covered everything, and if it wasn't a direct question, you covered it, and I think in, in some sense, other, and, yeah, and then in the context yeah. of the other responses. So, um, the the one thing that was a very kind of facty point that mm -hmm. um, was to confirm the address of Woman House is 533 Mariposa Street? If you say so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was the question. It was, can you confirm the, or please confirm the address? Um, Let us see if, if I included <laughs> it in my little book here. Yeah, it's one thing I did not look up before I came here to see if, I'm like, I wonder if that's online. I'm assuming Sharon's a, also an online maven, so I'm sure she looked as much as she could to find it. And yeah. To confirm, but. I hope so. <laughs> well, it's... Oops. Let me just see if we have it here. An old deserted mansion on a residential street in Hollywood became an environment. Mm -hmm. It was funny because Mira was emailing me madly. So when did we open Woman House to the public? <laughs> I found that date. No, I didn't. I didn't write down the address, but... Um, I'm sure it's somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> she located is 533 Mariposa Good, Street. that sounds right. So I'm going to write that down in my book. <laughs> Woman House, 533. Definitely Mariposa Street is right. Okay. That's Butterfly Street. Judy loved that, you know, because she was doing all this work about butterflies. What did you say, 537? 33. 33. 533, yep. That's that sounds right. Yeah, 533. <laughs> Mary Bosa Street in Hollywood. If that was the question number one, was can you confirm the address? I confirm it. <laughs> sounds, sounds good. <laughs> sounds absolutely right to me. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. Actually, I have a postcard somewhere because my friend Ulrike Müller, who was, um, was a student from Austria, was, who came to on her Fulbright for a year to L.A. to kind of rethink about 10 years after Woman House closed, and she interviewed a lot of us, and she did a little publication. I'll look in that publication mm -hmm. if I can find it. Um, she she went to, to find the location of Woman House, which um, since had, which had been pulled down because they put a, a sort of a, a throughway to the, to the Hollywood freeway, mm -hmm. you know, in that area. So 
All she found was this sort of bus waiting bench, <laughs> which she photographed, which right, was very really cool. Bench. Yeah, the waiting <laughs> bench, exactly. Yeah. And she made a set of postcards of it, you know, which I think might have the street address on them. And oh, I, that's... I'll take a look. I have them somewhere. It's nice to have, a, even if it's a small, tiny, you know, spatial legacy, it's nice mm. that there's something there to, that you can yeah. kind of go back to. Yeah, it's sort of become a dump and then... And then I went there later with a couple of the women who had been part of Women House, and we, we couldn't really find it. It looked like there was like a, a, a new sort of small apartment house that had been built in that mm -hmm. area, but, you know, it was it, the whole terrain had, had, had changed because they'd made an off-ramp, I think, mm -hmm. or an on-ramp onto the Hollywood Freeway there, because it was very close to the Hollywood Freeway, and they needed, they'd made a new, you know, lane or new on-ramp or something, so... The house itself doesn't exist anymore. We know that for sure. Yeah, so. this, according to Google Maps, the space that I'm looking at is the parking lot for a medical building. And there, you just stand there and you're like, so yeah. cool to think that the people I'm talking about were, were yeah. literally standing in the same space and now it's a parking lot. Yeah. It's sad and it's cool. You know, that, yeah. you know, time has marched on, things have changed, but yeah. you can still stand in the same physical yeah. location that the people mm. you've been studying for mm -hmm. five years, you know, walked back and forth. And yeah. Especially when you know somebody, you feel like you know somebody because you've been mm -hmm. writing about them for so long. Mm -hmm. it's, it's their space. It's, it's different for me. Like going to Mount Vernon, yeah. I don't have the same kind of like, oh, George Washington's house. Yeah. It just doesn't have the same thing. It's these everyday people yeah. that live their lives and that you are yeah. reconstructing. Yeah. You know, that yeah. you get to bring them back. Mm -hmm. I, just, I love that. Mm -hmm. That's why I love being a historian. It's just that, that those little little moments that come back. Yeah. So what are you um, going to do with all this archive stuff that you're doing? I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, the, the, I'm, Mary Studies dissertations are usually kind of lit or history based, so I'm, I'm mm -hmm. definitely in the history track of that. Um, How far I, along are you? I'm in my fourth year right now. Yeah. I have uh, remnants of a first chapter, mm -hmm. which I've been pretty, I've been slow this semester. The mm -hmm. semester's teaching load, I can turn this off, we don't have to talk about this one.